Hylomorphic dualism is Aristotle's view and Thomas Aquinas' view on the mind-body problem. How is it that the mind and the body interact? In ancient Greek philosophy, there was this problem of change. He said, how is it that substances endure through change? Like, let's say you get a haircut. It seems like you are the same person, the same thing you were before you got the haircut, but you don't have the same exact properties that you did before your haircut. Uh, you have longer hair before, you have shorter hair afterward. So the question is, how is it that there can be these substances that exist even though their properties change? And so the answer is, to the Greeks were, is it going to be through being or through non-being? And so let's take the first one of the dilemma, through being. Well, Parmenides and Zeno held to this. They said, um, if things differ, they must differ either in their being or in their non-being. If they differ in their non-being, they can't differ at all. And if they differ in their being, it's because they can't do that either. Um, because being is the one thing they have in common. Therefore, there can be no distinction between one thing and another. There's no way that things can differ, and therefore all is one. Now, that seems bizarre and striking. We seem to live in a world of plural objects, but remember, this is a purely rationalistic approach to the issue. I think that all change is uh, through being, and therefore change can only be illusory. There can't be actual real change, there can't be a plurality of things, and Zeno's whole paradoxes is a series of arguments that multiple objects, distances, and all the like can't exist. It's all just illusory. The second is the chaos theory, which is that there are no underlying substances at all. Heraclitus has been accused of this, saying you can't even step into the same river twice, or even once. So, uh, it's almost like the world is sort of like frames in a movie, where each successful frame has nothing to do with the previous one. They, they, they just come into existence, and so there's no enduring objects, and so let's say if you punish someone for doing something bad, you're not punishing the same person who committed the crime. The next is atomism, and modern, a lot of modern like atheism really likes to go with atomism. So on ancient atomism, there's nothing but atoms and void. So these atoms are these fundamental particles. Uh, however, like in today's modern science, it'd be quarks. The ancients had a little bit different view of atoms, but basically, if, and philosophically, it, it, it worked well enough uh, that we can compare it to like quarks. So we've got uh, quarks that are arranged chair-wise and door-wise and stone-wise. So there really aren't chairs and doors and stones and people and animals. There's just fundamental particles arranged in different configurations. These particles are limited in their properties. And the thing is, even quarks can be transformed into other quarks in quantum physics. And so there's, there's some difficulties with atomism. For example, if the particles are limited in their properties, what is it that makes them limited, that gives them those limits? Um, and it seems like from the atomist view, it just has to be a total brute fact of reality. It's like there's no why, there's no explanation beyond it. You just have to accept it, just take it on faith. Um, there's also the question of how do we know which particles are arranged stone-wise without reference to the stone. And so to say uh, that there's no objects but particles arranged chair-wise, door-wise, and etc., we need to make references to those objects in order to show which particles are arranged that way, which particles aren't, and so we're, we end up arguing in a circle. So atomism seems kind of unsatisfying. There's, it definitely has its philosophical problems. Now Aristotle had this solution by splitting reality, uh, or being, into two modes of being. So, we'll split being into actuality, which is the way a thing is, and potentiality, the way a thing could potentially be. So, actuality, um, actually I have a cup in front of me and it's blue, that's the way it actually is. Potentially it could be filled with Coca-Cola, it isn't right now, but it could be, it's a way it could potentially be. Um, the match has the ability to potentially burn, uh, and your paper has the ability to potentially be burned by a match. There's also this thing called form and matter. So, the idea of matter to an Aristotelian is a bit different than it is to modern scientists. Prime matter is whatever the raw substance is that needs actualizing. One modern Thomist said that since matter and energy are two forms of the same thing, that raw substance could be what we call prime matter. And so that, that raw stuff, whatever you call that, is, 
is the thing that needs actualizing and change. It can't exist without some sort of form. Form is its actualization. So this raw stuff can exist in terms of like photons or in terms of like um, hydrogen atoms or, or uh, as like a cup or as like a rabbit. So it has to be put into some sort of form in order to actually exist. There's no such thing as raw matter existing without some sort of form, even if it's loose. That that looseness is itself a kind of form. So the form is what actualizes the potentiality. Now, there's this thing, idea called Cartesian dualism, which is a solution to the problem of the mind and body. So on Cartesian dualism, um, extension is the essence of the material world. So for something to be material is to be extended in space-time. Uh, again, the chairs and doors and all these other physical things are extended and have a space to temporal location, um, but God, let's say, uh, is not located in space-time and therefore would not be considered material. Angels, if they're not located and not extended, would also be immaterial substances. So, on Cartesian dualism, they share the same mechanistic view of the world, meaning that um, it's a bunch of um, mindless, meaningless, non-free, non-rational, brute physical particles banging around in a, f in a purely either deterministic way or with simple, uh, simple randomness thrown in, a little swerve going on there. And so the Cartesians share the same view of the physical world as the modern atheists. They just add to it this immaterial soul, this immaterial substance. So the mind is immaterial, wholly unextended, and not existing in any particular location. And of course, this leads to things like the interaction problem. How does something physical interact with something non-physical? And so there's, there's problems that emerge, um, which is why a lot of philosophers of the mind aren't Cartesian dualists. But there is another solution. And so the solution is hylomorphic dualism. Under hylomorphic dualism, we are composed of form and matter. We have this prime matter, whatever this you know, matter energy substance is. That's the raw matter. And however it's arranged in our body, its arrangement and actualization, uh, we call that the soul. And so the, uh, you see someone's soul just by seeing their body. You're like, yep, they you can see them interact and they therefore have a soul. And the soul has properties beyond merely the shape of the body. Um, there's, I think it's veget you know, I think it's like vegetative, um, animal, and then rational are the three sort of um, stages or the, the hierarchy of the soul. So you have vegetative properties, the, like the ability to consume nutrition is something that the, the body or the soul of, let's say, a, a plant has that um, a rock, let's say, wouldn't have. There's also the ability to move and, and sense and think and also to form abstractions. Part of the rational human soul is the ability to sense, to have this idea of like triangularity, you know, roundness, redness, abstract from particular instances of red something that humans have, but animals very likely do not have. Um, because the soul is also the form of the body, it's detectable through sense experience. And so we have no issue of like philosophical zombies, people who seem to appear as we are but have no soul, let's say. Because uh, if the soul is the form of the body, it eliminates that, and also the soul is detectable by sense experience. And so we have several of the solutions to Cartesian dualism in hylomorphic dualism. And so the benefits are, it allows for distinction between inorganic material, vegetative life, sensitive life, and rational life. Uh, it gives us uh, a very clear distinction of life and non-life, because we just have to look at what properties these things have. Um, and, it's, and in science, it's even controversial whether chemistry can ultimately redu be reduced to physics. Um, and attempts to reduce one level to another are fraught with deeper problems. It's not like we can just take uh, science in some sort of hierarchy that biology is applied chemistry and physics, um, and that's and then that's based on mathematics um, the way they have in that XKCD comic. Um, that's not well established at all. But again, under hylomorphic dualism, we just don't have the same problem because we have maybe a richer view of causation that's beyond simple mechanistic uh, causation of science. And so, again, the distinction between Cartesian dualism and hylomorphic dualism is that under Cartesian dualism, the soul is totally detached from the body. It's not physical, it's not extended, it's not sensible in any way. Um, it's wholly immaterial, wholly not located anywhere, and that leads to certain philosophical problems. 
Hylomorphic dualism, on the other hand, abandons this mechanistic view and has this idea of like universals in nature, that there is this thing called redness in, let's say, my car, or that there is a thing called final causation. Like final causation is that for the purpose of which something happens. Like the, the sculptor sculpts the statue for the purpose of impressing a client. And that's why the, the efficient causation, his like hand movements and everything operate in a certain way because of the final cause. Modern science has, has stripped science, has a, a stripped nature of its final causation uh, for its, its purpose of which existing in everything and that now leads to a bunch of other problems. But under hylomorphic dualism, again, we don't have any of these problems.